Hello and welcome to another EG Recap. I'm Jack Lindsay and I've got one, two, three, four stories for you today. Up first, co-founder of id Software John Carmack appears on the Joe Rogan Experience. Then, NBA 2K20 trailer shows off my team's casino-style systems. Modders are working on bringing a port of Red Dead Redemption to the PC. And Chernobylite gets a brand new gameplay trailer. Though you won't see them implemented yet, don't think I've forgotten your graphical requests. It's just time is scarce. But let's jump into the news. Mr. Irwin tells us that John Carmack isn't an easy man to pin down. With a reputation for being buried in his work and a dedication to living beyond his own expectations, we really don't see much of Carmack in the limelight these days. That is until now, with a recent appearance on the widely popular podcast The Joe Rogan Experience. Sitting down for a nearly three-hour tell-all with the comedian and MMA commentator, John Carmack and Joe Rogan act like they've been friends forever and have one of the most fluid and organic interviews featured on the podcast. Well, <laughs> to be fair, Joe is like that with a lot of people. He's just easy to get along with, apparently. About halfway through the podcast, after talking at length about the advances in computing and even dabbling in a conversation about quantum computing, Joe describes thinking about the pressure game developers have to be under saying, God, how much work is involved in these things? John Carmack goes on to describe just how different the various regions of tech fields are, and while many big companies have many different benefits, the world of video games is pretty unforgiving. You look at the game industry. It doesn't pay well. There are less, there's less job security and they work you a lot harder. There's the problem of the fact that when you have an industry, and this has been the way of artists forever, where if you've got something that people are passionate about and want to be involved in, supply and demand works its way and you wind up with a situation where they don't have to be paid as much. Speaking on the controversy of working long hours, Carmack describes that he's more comfortable with a 60-hour work week and can work up to 13 hours a day by dividing the work among different aspects of a project instead of narrowing in on one specific point. Carmack feels that his passion for his work is what encourages his work ethic, and that when people are in that sort of situation, it can lead to great things. The other side of this is that it allows products that otherwise couldn't exist to exist by working at that level in a way that maybe couldn't be sustained in other, in other industries. Probably many of the greatest things that were ever made in gaming were only possible by people throwing themselves at that level at it. He would go on to bring up the topic of developer unionization and his reasoning for being against it. There is some serious debate about it. Some people despise that about the industry, that nobody should work that hard. There are people that think there literally should be laws to prevent people from working that hard. I always have to argue against that. There's a power to obsession, where being able to absolutely obsess over something and throw your life's work instead of a work-life balance is your life's work. Everybody will point back and say, well, that worked great for you. You're the founder of a company. You were in a position where you got to make your own decisions. But is that okay, but is that okay for the 19-year-old out of a game dev program that's being overworked? I have to be aware that my view into the game industry is obviously very colored by my experiences. I never actually have worked inside one of the big EA or Activision studios. It's possible they have some valid criticisms, but I still think it's great when people throw themselves at it beyond the point of even what other people think is reasonable. They have free will. They've chosen to do that. If that's what they think is going to help them get close to their goals, I'm not going to try to make that impossible for them. Both the gaming industry and the gaming community enjoy a lot of what goes on today thanks to the efforts of Carmack and those like him, who spearheaded a quickly growing industry when video games really started to take off in popularity in a time that seems like only yesterday. If you have the time, you definitely owe it to yourself to listen to this podcast. It's not often industry legends take the time out of their lives to just lay everything out on the table. If this interview with John Carmack isn't enough, be sure to check out Gavin Anon's interview with the Doom guy himself. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so Jonathan included an, a link to an article that uh, another one of our writers did where he wrote as if he were interviewing Doom Guy. That link is included as well as the link to the John Carmack episode of the Joe Rogan Experience in the article I've linked below. But you know, the madness of working as a game dev has been circulating a lot in the news lately. And I've actually been getting some first-hand experience, some first-hand insight into what this is like. In addition to writing, editing, and curating news for exclusively games, and reaching out to developers and trying to set up interviews, and recording and editing and uploading these EG recaps, and assembling all the hardware and learning all the software that's necessary for these things, I've also been working as a writer and designer in an indie dev studio. And I'm not going to get into that here, but this is my best advice for any of you looking to get into game development. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? You might want to get a pen and paper, because this will save your life one day if you go down this road. Are you ready? You better make damn sure if you want to be a game dev in any capacity, and you're going to be just starting out in that career, that you are either single or that you and your partner have a rock solid bond. Because the time demands that something like that puts on you absolutely will test your relationship. 
That's just a bit of wisdom from old Jack Lindsay for you prospective game devs out there. I'm not saying don't do it, don't go for it. Every dev I talk to talks about how brutally hard it is, but every single one of them says they wouldn't trade it for the world. It's a dream. Doing it feels like a dream, but divorce is a nightmare. So you best factor that into your equations if you're thinking about becoming a game dev. Our next story from Mr. Kreis and I starts off by saying, we thought it couldn't get worse, and then Battlefront 2 tied basic features to loot boxes, and since then games have continually pushed the envelope. The worst offender is clearly GTA 5's Diamond Casino, which has been banned in several countries for being outright gambling. But NBA 2K20 is giving it a run for its money. <laughs> no pun intended. In the My Team mode, players can do plenty of fun, totally 100% not gambling things. Open card packs, spin some prize wheels, use actual slot machines and pachinko machines. Have a good time. It is so very clearly gambling mechanics that it hurts. If people have complained about loot box mechanics before, they should be enraged by this content. Not only are there random loot boxes with random card packs, read random loot boxes with random loot boxes inside them, but there are also slot machines, pachinko machines, and prize wheels. All of this comes with the login rewards, which incentivize players to return day after day. If you're a legal, consenting adult, all of this is totally okay. You should be allowed to spend money as you wish, but 2K20 is not for adults. It's not rated adults only, mature, or even teen. No, NBA 2K20 is rated E for everyone. Now, as you can see, I've had footage from this commercial Tyler's been talking about playing in the background. I'm gonna have to agree with him that the publishers for this game are prime candidates for my live TV volcano catapult program. I mean, just look how many you, you, you see those guys in the bottom left-hand corner cheering, and oh, I'm not gonna, one of them's saying, I'm not gonna look, I'm not gonna look, as he essentially pulls the arm on a slot machine, and then since it's a commercial, of course he turns around and he's won a lot of money. And this is at a time where loot box style mechanics and gambling and things like that are under immense scrutiny in the United States. You had that EA lady in Congress with that thousand yard stare talking about it's not loot boxes, it's surprise mechanics. And it's just truly revolting. And I don't think, I think this is actually something that almost the entire industry is united against. I think actually most of the gaming press finds this reprehensible. I don't, I'm not aware of anyone defending it. It's already illegal in lots of countries. I hope it becomes illegal here soon. I know people always say adults can do with their money whatever they want. And that's true. I want it illegal for different reasons though. I want it illegal because when it's legal, it becomes something for publishers to push their developers to divert time and resources to when making their game that could instead have gone to making actually good content. As long as it's an open door, these little goblins are gonna be scrambling to get in there. So it would be better for the industry as a whole, although worse for executive bonus checks, if we could just ban this stuff. This does not make good games. Just make good games. That's gonna be the logo one day. If I ever open a game development studio, it's gonna be just make good games. In our next story, Mr. Irwin tells us about the Red Dead Redemption Remaster Mod Project. For months, rumors have been circulating about Red Dead Redemption 2 coming to PC in some capacity, whether it be a port or a remaster. Well, Modern Gaming Dam has gotten tired of waiting, it would seem, as he has teased the upcoming Red Dead Redemption Damned Enhancement Project, which is a modification version of the Xbox 360 and PS4 versions of the game, running on Xenia and RPCS3 emulators for PC. In a post on GTA forums, Gaming Dam revealed the project saying that it had redefined graphical elements in high quality, including, but not limited to, textures, UI, UX, menu elements, in-game HUD, draw optimizations, shader and model updates, alpha, beta stuff, and much more. While the project is certainly exciting news for many, it's important to keep hopes from getting too high for now. In the past, companies like Konami and Capcom have crushed fan-made projects that sought to revitalize old games and bring them to PC players. Time will tell what lies ahead for this ambitious undertaking, but in the meantime, at least PC players have a small shot at seeing Red Dead Redemption on their screens. If you're interested in joining the Damned Enhancement project, Gaming Damned is reaching out for volunteers on the forum post where the project was revealed. Now, Mr. Irwin has included that forum post in his article that I've linked below, so you can find it that way. Earlier this year, Tyler Kras and I covered the reveal of a source code that hinted at the possibility of Red Dead Redemption 2 coming to PC, and Mr. Irwin wrote at length about one of the more mysterious and interesting characters of the Red Dead universe, the Strange Man. I never got around to playing Red Dead 2. I've heard nothing but good things, which always makes me kind of wonder. There's definitely a trend among gamers for whatever reason, it's probably not specific to gamers, that if they like something and you criticize it, even if you like it, even if you agree that it's a good product and you would recommend it, but you bring criticisms against it, they, uh, they pretty much spaz out. 
So don't know if I believe it's God's gift to mankind, but if it comes to PC, I might check it out. Being part of the Master Race, I only have a PC, but after I saw this little gameplay clip, I knew I'd have to check it out if it ever got ported. Our last story for the day, and we are definitely going over 10 minutes on this one, comes from Mr. Krasnai, and it is about a brand new gameplay trailer for Chernobylite. Now he's embedded the full trailer in his article, which I'll link to below, and I'm gonna have footage of it playing in the background while I talk, but I'm actually gonna read from an article I wrote back in April about Chernobylite, because it's just, uh, it's just better. Have you ever wanted to go exploring through the abandoned ruins of Chernobyl, but just couldn't get past the whole internal bleeding and vomiting death thing? Well now, Polish developers of the Farm 51 are here to feed your need. From its own description, Chernobylite is a science fiction survival horror experience mixing the free exploration of its disturbing world with challenging combat, unique crafting, and non-linear storytelling. But what's really amazing about this project is how the developers built it. These professional madmen created a virtual replica of Chernobyl in its sister city, Pripyat, by going there and performing photogrammetry scans. All of the environments in the game are modeled on the actual abandoned complexes of the fallen cities, whether from data gathered on foot or by drone. You can see them traipsing about the exclusion zone in footage that I included in my article, which I'll link to below as well. Creative director, first name I don't know how to pronounce, the last name Pazdur, was nine years old when the number four reactor at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant suffered a catastrophic failure. Even though he lived a few hundred kilometers away, he remembers not understanding why he was forbidden to eat fresh fruits and vegetables and taking government-ordered iodine solutions to counteract radiation exposure. Apparently they tasted disgusting. Since that time, Chernobyl has become a lingering ghost for Pazdur, a wordless call that draws him back to the silent city. In 2016, he created the Chernobyl VR Project, an interactive virtual documentary also linked to in my article. It was during the construction of this project that Pazdur and his team started becoming familiar with the exclusion zone. A few years later, the idea of a survival horror game drew him back to Chernobyl in order to tell a deeply personal story. The Farm 51 describes the city as a real-world post-apocalyptic experience. After several return visits, the team began to ask themselves, what if you had to spend a couple of weeks here? In Chernobylite, you get to experience the answer to that question. Every day you have to take care of food, medicines, and other resources, say the devs. Any bullet you shoot could be more useful later, and believe me, sooner or later you will pull the trigger, not necessarily to kill another human being. Players assume the role of an ex-physicist of the Chernobyl power plant, drawn back to the contamination zone to investigate the mysterious disappearance of their wife. Cooperation will be necessary for survival, and there are several other inhabitants within the exclusion zone that you may choose to interact with, either as friends or foes. Chernobylite's story is non-linear, and the plot will adapt to your decisions. Different playthroughs, different plots. You don't get to know how it ends, you decide. And remember how the environments are all created with photogrammetry? Well, the character designs are all created with an in-house 3D scanning technology called Reality 51, also linked to in my article. That means each character design actually starts as a costume design, which is physically constructed and worn by the developers, who then go on to be scanned on location in Chernobyl to create as realistic an effect as possible. The picture I've got in the background right now is the Farm 51 graphic designer Josia standing in a virtual replica of the abandoned building she was photographed in. She said of her experiences in Chernobyl that it, quote, turned out to be survival camp for me. During our shooting sessions, I had to play in light dresses around zero degrees Celsius. I was freezing and I couldn't show it. That's mostly what their Kickstarter was about. Back then, they said a lot of hard work awaits us in the extreme conditions of the zone, with no electricity or internet, but it will pay off. With our Kickstarter campaign, we mostly want to expand the Chernobylite world with, with its heart of darkness, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. That cannot mean what it sounds like, I hear you thinking to yourself. But it did. It meant exactly what it sounded like. To accurately recreate it as a whole game location, Pazder said, referring to the god dang power plant, we need to make several more very difficult and expensive trips. Working close to the nuclear power plant, especially inside, under many radiation-related restrictions, is much harder. We know how to do it, but we need your support. Have you ever heard of a Kickstarter for a game that was raising funds to help its developers get inside of an irradiated nuclear reactor? No. No, you haven't. 
Back when I wrote the article, the Farm 51 had managed to raise $40,000 of their $100,000 goal. Today, they're up to $206,000, over doubling it. And it looks like you can still pledge. You can do, yeah, I'm looking at it right now. You can do a late pledge. And there are multiple links to this Kickstarter in the article I'm including. Originally, you could pledge anywhere from two to a couple thousand dollars to receive an assortment of rewards. I never read through all of them, but I have to assume one of the larger pledges got you named in thanks during one of the developer's inevitable funerals. Chernobylite is coming out in fall this year for Steam, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4. And if you want the developer's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, official website, I've got you covered in my article. Now at last, you can explore Chernobyl. Or at least in as realistic a way as has ever been conceived. I may find myself there in time, wandering through the reconstructed world of a hundred thousand photographs, images of the silent city held in eternal stillness, like ghosts that call wordlessly, beckoning us deeper into the ruins. But that'll do it today, my lovely YouTubers. I'm glad to hear you don't mind me going over 10 minutes, most of you anyway. Some of you wanted 45 minute recaps so you could listen while you drive places. Not as much as I'd love to oblige, I do not have that kind of time. But maybe if you all like, share, comment, and subscribe, this YouTube page will blow up and I could maybe do some longer articles. Best get on it. I'll see you next time.